Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. There is no question our God is a good God. And God forgets none of His people. Every individual, no matter what they have as a profession, no matter what country they live in, God loves all people. And if we are wise enough to invite God into our life, God will go to work for us and bring us to the people that He wants us to become, entering into a covenant whereby we will enjoy eternity with Him. And this is clearly going to be seen in this fourth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Colossians. So with that said, take out your Bible and look there with me. The epistle to the Colossians in chapter 4. Now, we were talking about families in the last section of chapter 3, and we were speaking about a relationship a relationship between one who has authority over another. And Paul's going to continue this at the beginning of chapter 4. And notice what he says. Look with me to that fourth chapter and verse 1. He says, and masters, now it's that word kurios, and it means it can be translated as Lord, meaning the Lord God Almighty, but as I said last week, it is a word of authority. So he is warning those who are in a position of authority. Now, the reason why he does this is because in many relationships, there is one who has greater authority. Let me give you an example. In a marital relationship, the husband has greater authority. Between parents and children, parents have greater authority. Between those who employ and those who are employees, the employer has greater authority. Between government leaders and citizens, those authorities have, of course, greater power. And he's dealing with those individuals who, for whatever reason, find themselves in this this position. And he warns them. Notice what it says, chapter 4. And masters, show or offer or give, however you want to translate this word. And once again, It's a commandment. It's not an option. He is commanding people with authority. He says, show them justice and equality to the servants. Show them, even though you may have authority, there is still justice and equality between them and you. So he's speaking about, yes, There's a a change in this working relationship, this family connection, whatever it might be. But nevertheless, there is a necessity, a must, a commandment from God that this relationship manifests justice. And secondly, there is equality. Meaning just because one might have authority over another, that doesn't mean that these two people aren't of equal worth, equal value. So God is very specific about this. So he says, Masters, those with authority, justice and equality demonstrate, show, offer to the servants. Why? Knowing that also you have a Lord, a master, an authority in heaven. So he's revealing an important truth, and that is this. The measure that you measure will be measured back to you. In the same way that, let's say this person, he is authority over another one, and how he deals with him. Well, this is going to also give a result for how the master of all masters, the Lord of all lords, 
the authority over all authorities respond. So he says, realize that you have a Lord in the heavens. Therefore, what we should do? Well, if we're people of authority, we need to be people of prayer. I want you to hear that. The more authority that you have, the greater amount of time you need to spend in prayer. You know, the best example of that is Messiah himself. Because Messiah, we know that he would go out at times all night to a quiet place, to a mountaintop, being alone, so that he could pray. Now, if Messiah prayed throughout the night frequently, how much more you and me? If the Son of God did so, certainly we should be people of prayer. So it's not an accident. After speaking to those who have authority, he says these words, look now to verse 2. He says, in prayer, continue. And then he says, watch. Now, this is an important word, watch. It's used in light of prayer, for example, when Messiah was in the Garden of Gethsemane that night that he was betrayed, the night before he was crucified. He took his disciples to that garden and he said, pray with me, but he used the term watch. Same word here. In regard to the last days, we are admonished by Messiah to be watching. And what it says here, yes, we need to continue in prayer. And he says, watching. Why? Well, what are we supposed to be watching for? Prophetic signs. As these days approach, the end times, it should cause us to grow in obedience, grow in submissiveness. When we see the reality of prophetic truth approaching. So that's why he says, very important, he says, and watch in it, watch in prayer with thanksgiving, praying at that moment concerning us in order that God would open up for us a door of the word to speak. Now, Paul is saying to those in authority, you need to be people of prayer and you need to be people that are watching, watching these prophetic indicators as the time comes to an end. And he says, in light of that, we need to be people who are serious about this emphasis, this urgency for the word of the Lord. And that's why we do what we do, that we are investing more and more in additional countries, additional places, in different ways, using the internet and different means in order to get out God's Word. We're not trying to share what, what we want, but we're trying to accurately, humbly, and faithfully carry out the teaching of the Word of God. And this is what was of interest to Paul. And that's why he says, you pray at this time also concerning us. What specifically? In order that God would open up for us a door for his word to speak. And to speak what? Notice what it says. The mystery of Messiah. Now, what does he mean here? The mystery of Messiah. Well, when we look at the scripture, there are, are three primary things that we see in the New Covenant that are called mysteries. One is the congregation of the redeemed, the church. The prophets really didn't see this, this, what we would call the church age. They felt Messiah would come, come once, and the kingdom would begin. So they didn't see that that was a mystery to them. And the mystery of Messiah, well, we could be speaking about the fact that there's a suffering Messiah. Now, this suffering Messiah, for the most part, I mean, we see it in the scripture. Judaism oftentimes speaks of it not as Messiah, but as the Jewish people. But when we look, for example, as the book of, of Isaiah, it's clearly, not in all places, but in the majority, that suffering servant is not the Jewish people. Most frequently, it is Messiah. So he may be speaking about Christ and Him crucified, Him suffering for our sin, being that sacrifice, spilling His blood, 
so that we could be redeemed. But he also talks about, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and other places, it speaks about a mystery, this blessed hope. And what I would share with you is this, that this blessed hope concerns only the congregation of redeemed. It is a type of resurrection which is manifested first by the death of Messiah. He died first so that he could rise again. And Paul is talking about an open door that he could share the mystery of Messiah. And notice what he says. Also, on account of which this mystery that I have been bound. He's speaking to the fact that he's still in prison. He writes this epistle like he did Galatians and others while he is in prison. And he says, may God open up the door, and I believe he's speaking about that prison door, that he may carry out speaking about the mystery of Messiah and that he might do so. Doing what? Look now to verse 4. In order that I manifest it. Now, what's he talking about it? Well, he's talking about that mystery that he might manifest, make known this mystery as it's necessary for me to speak. Paul doesn't want to say anything more. What's he showing here? This is what he's showing. He is showing submissiveness. He is showing a demonstration for recognizing authority. He says, I want to be prayed for not only for the opportunity to speak, but also that I speak as I should, at as fitting as Messiah would have me to speak, that I might manifest this ministry and do so as it's necessary for me to speak, verse 5, in wisdom that you should walk to those who are outside. So Paul's saying, I need to do this, but he turns it back to them. That they need to have a lifestyle, a behavior, a walk that is what? Worthy of their call and is appropriate for those who are outside, meaning outside the body of believers, not part of the congregation, those who are not yet believers. Doing what? Doing the time, redeeming the time. And that's an important term redeeming the time. Here's what he's speaking about. We know that there is an enemy, an enemy that that wages spiritual battle against us. Now, oftentimes that battle manifests itself physically. And because of that, we see that that he, unfortunately, he has uh, victories in many battles. But here's the good news. When we speak the truth, when we walk in a way that we should, what Satan has, has defeated, what he has destroyed, this time that he has wasted, you know what? Through the gospel, that time can be redeemed. Through the gospel, it can take that which was, was and was bad, and it can transform it into something good, redeeming the time. And that's the power of, of, of spiritual truth. That's the power of the Holy Spirit to bring about a redemption of all things, that He can restore what the enemy has, has, has torn down. And therefore He says, verse 6, and your word, that is your speech, always have it be seasoned with salt and grace. Now, Paul frequently When he speaks, he emphasizes the grace of God. And the grace of God saves, but also the grace of God brings an obedient change into a person's life. Grace saves. We're saved not by work. It's a free gift, but that grace continues to do a second work in our life. It produces obedience. It produces the will, the purposes of God in our life. So he says here, let's go back to verse 5. He says, in all wisdom, you should walk before those who are outside, redeeming the time, and let your speech always, always be with grace, having been seasoned with salt. For what purpose? Knowing how it's necessary for you to answer 
each one. Now that word answer is just that, it's a term of response. Now here's the key. We are going to get insight and revelation from God in how to respond to people. But here's the key. He's only going to do that when we're demonstrating the grace that we have received. And I want to say that again. God is only going to move mightily in our life, providing what we need to be successful in accomplishing His purposes when we are living and manifesting the grace that we have received from our Lord Yeshua. And when we are doing that, God is going to provide us the wisdom, He's already talked about that, and the knowledge in order that we will be able to respond, that we will answer those questions that people have. Look now to verse, verse 7. And the things concerning me, all these things, Paul's situation, he says an individual. His name is Tychichos, the beloved brethren and the faithful servant and the fellow servant. Now, it's faithful minister and, and joint servant, bond servant in the Lord. He says he will make known to you. So what's he going to do? Well, he says, as we continue on in verse 8, Paul's going to send this one. And look at what he says once more about him. His name is Tychichos. And he is one that's called a beloved brother. He's also a faithful minister, a joint bondservant in the Lord. Now, Paul's going to do something as we move to the conclusion of chapter 4. Paul is going to begin to name individuals, and these names of people are those who serve with Paul. And this tells us something. It tells us that Paul realizes that he can't do all things himself, that he's dependent upon other joint, joint servants of Messiah, playing a role in his ministry and his playing a role in their ministry. So he's going to send this individual that they do something that he makes known to them Paul's situation. He says, look at verse, verse 8 at the end. He says, whom I will send to you for this same purpose. In order that, now there's a difference. We need to pause for a moment and realize what I'm going to say. If you're following with the King James, it's probably going to be in an agreement. If you're following from a different uh, uh, Bible, see, the King James uses the Texas Receptus, that Greek New Testament, as the basis for the translation into whatever language you might be dealing with. We'll say English in this case. But if you're using another Bible, more often than not, other Bibles use a different Greek New Testament called Nestle Allen. And there are some slight differences. Now, usually these differences don't have major theological implications. But, but the Nestle Allen one says that you might know. But here it says in the Texas Receptus that he might make known to you concerning things. Now, he's coming in order that he might make known to them their situation. And also, he says, that he might encourage your heart. So he's got two purposes, to make known to them Paul's situation, but also, it says, he shall, shall make known the things concerning you. Your situation, he's going to set it in order. He's going to bring more information to them in order that they might grow and mature and be more successful in the things of God. Move now to verse 9. Not only is he going to send this one, but he mentions another one. With, he's coming with a man by the name of Onesimus, who is a faithful and beloved brother who is from you. So someone from this congregation, he has left that congregation, he has joined with the Apostle Paul, and now Paul is sending him with this other individual back to Colossae for that same purpose. Look again, with Onesimus, 
this faithful and beloved brother who is from you. And it says, and all they will make known to you concerning the things that are here. So again, Paul has two purposes, to make known what's going on in his location, but also to set straight, to give additional wisdom. This is what they're going to be doing, bringing this letter, reading this letter, in order to give them greater insight about their circumstances. Look now to verse, verse 10. Another individual, and his name is Ar, Arstikos. He greets you, who is what? My fellow prisoner. Now, this individual, apparently, he is a prisoner with Paul, suffering like Paul. And he says, this man, Artikos, he greets you, this fellow prisoner of mine, also Mark, the niece of, or the nephew of, of Barnabas, concerning whom you've received, and notice this, commandments. Now, this is an important truth because he says that, that Mark, who is a nephew of Barnabas, he has come, he has taught, and you've received what? Commandments. Now, so many times people want to say, well, they're only New Testament commandments. No, they would be all the biblical commandments. In fact, think about something for a moment. When, when this was written, there was no New Testament. It had not been assembled yet. They were getting this, just this epistle. So when they heard commandments, they wouldn't think, oh, New Testament commandments. New Testament didn't exist in that sense. They would have understood that these are the commandments of God. That this man, Mark, the nephew of Barnabas, he taught them, he gave them, they received the commandments through him. Verse Verse 10 at the second part, and if he should come to you, receive him. Verse 11, also Jesus. Now, this is the same name for Jesus or Joshua or Yeshua, the one who is called Justice, whom, and it's talking about all of these individuals, whom are being from the circumcision, meaning all of these individuals are Jewish. They are coming to this congregation. And I think this puts a large, large uh, help in understanding what he means by commandments previously. So these are of the circumcision who these only, and he emphasizes this, these only are our fellow servants, fellow workers for the kingdom of God. Now, this is so important because we see once more what is Paul's foundational desire? And that is to teach truth concerning the kingdom of God. See, you cannot go too many places in the scripture before you encounter something that has to do with the kingdom of God. And Paul saw him, it's undeniable, he saw himself as a fellow servant with these people for the purpose, he says it's very clear, the kingdom of God. And something more than that, he says, these, he says, having comfort me. These making comfort for me. Also, another individual, look at tw uh, verse 12, Ephraphus, he greets you, this one also from you, a servant of Messiah, always, always struggling in your behalf. In prayers imagine that this individual struggling in battle how on his knees praying in behalf of this congregation he says he prays frequently constantly with zeal why in order that you might stand perfect and complete in all things and what the will of God now, I want you to see how the scripture is put together, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Because Paul has said two things that are so important. He's spoken about the kingdom of God, and then he's closed out this section with the term, the will of God. 
and realize it's not by chance. There is that inherent relationship between the kingdom of God and the will of God. If you want to experience kingdom power in your life, if you want to experience kingdom revelation, then what should be the passion of your life? What should you be pursuing? The answer is easy. The will of God. One of the things that you should be doing is just like this individual. You should be praying. Praying, struggling in prayer that God would make known to you His will. And prayer and faithful obedience doing what His Word clearly commands is going to give you greater insight. It is going to be a source, an impetus for the revelation of God's will to be given to you. And when you walk in His will, you're manifesting the kingdom, that kingdom power, that kingdom order, that kingdom truth. And that is what being a disciple, a follower of Messiah, is all about. So it's not an accident here. Look again at the text. Paul is speaking and he says, these individuals are the only, he emphasizes, the only fellow servants in the kingdom of God. And what did they do? They comforted him. And he speaks about this individual who is of this congregation, a servant of the Lord, always struggling in your behalf in prayer in order that you stand. That's a word of victory. That you stand perfect and complete in all things of the will of God. What a blessed statement. And that should motivate us. That should change us. That should give us insight that we need to be people who are passionate of the will of God. And what should that cause you to do? To get on your knees and say, God, help me empty myself of those things that I'm seeking for myself. My objectives, my wants, my desires, what I think I should be, what I think I should achieve, what I think I should be doing. God, nail those to the cross. Change me that I might know your will and that I might be faithfully carrying it out. Equip me, make your provision to me so I can be spiritually successful, to be rich in good deeds and those things that are pleasing to you and manifest your presence in my life. When you pray in this way, your life will be different. Well, I'll close with that. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.